Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, first, I'd like to thank BIC, of course, but especially Aruna, uh, I met last year. And so we have the idea uh, uh, to organize this talk. And finally, it was possible. And also, because I'm sorry, uh, I stay a very short time here in Bangalore, and despite it is my first visit, but already uh, my stay here was very, very rich. And I want to uh, really thank all the people I met, a number are here, uh, for their uh, welcome and uh, uh, availability. So thank you very much. Yeah, uh, no, oh, and also I want to thank Aruna because she uh, briefly put how I came to be interested by SIND and SIND studies because I know that it would have been a question for many, and of course I understand, so uh, thank you for this. Now, yeah, what I plan to do, um, of course, it is from my own academic perspective, so mainly history and contemporary history. So, for example, even I have some knowledge about uh, Moen Jodaro, I'm not a specialist at all, because mostly I've worked on 19 and 20, 21st century SIND, and Cindy, so first time as a um, historian, and second as anthropologist. Uh, what I want to say it is that uh, there are, when you are working on the history of Sindh, even if it is a uh, recent history, 19th, 20th century, of course you are totally depending on the available sources. And every historian is obsessed by the issue of sources because what you can know of history is totally related to the sources you will be able to find out, to collect, etc. And in Sindh, uh, before colonization, uh, as you know, the British came to Sindh in 1843. So before, uh, especially even before the 18th century, there is a scarcity of sources. When I speak about sources, they are mostly uh, written sources, manuscript sources. Of course, there are, and as you should know, uh, before this uh, British colonization, Persian was the main language used by the Sindhi uh, intellectuals, historian, and other. So before, until the 18th century, and even the 90, early 19th century, almost all the sources for knowing the history of sin are in Persian. They are available because they are regularly printed and reprinted, but they are in Persian, and uh, some of them are not translated uh, into uh, any other language. So uh, it is the first point. And uh, when I was doing my research on different um, traditions, cultural, religious tradition of sin, so it was a uh, the first observation I had to do. It is this kind of scarcity of sources. So, of course, when you face such a challenge, you have to find out other ways to know the past. Uh, so that's why I developed also an interest, especially in iconography. So how different uh, figures, uh, sacred figures mostly are represented through iconography. Uh, it can be through painting, it can be through sculptures of other. And also I was interested into the, uh, what we call material culture, culture. So this can be the object, but also the building, the build structures. So even if I not, uh, of course, a specialist of this field, uh, mainly iconography, which is related to art history and the build structure. It could be related to architecture, I don't know, even also art history. I use this uh, data for my own historical and even anthropological uh, work. And so today what I intend to do um, is to, through the, uh, how to say, Okay, I give you the subtitle I was thinking about. The subtitle of this conference, I was thinking about something like 
Um, I have to remember. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, uh, there are two, two uh, process of building a tradition. So there is the symbolic construction of a community. Uh, finally, finally, what did a group of people form a community? Uh, for example, through worshiping uh, such deity, such saint, and also, so this is what I call the symbolic construction of the community, but also it is to be compared with the material construction of the community. And the material construction of the community, it is the building, and how the build structure mirrors what the community think about itself, what in the build structure the community put and want the other, the non-community people, to see and to understand about themselves. So uh, I would uh, try to develop this uh, uh, approaches and perspective. But as I, as I said, and I shall stop about these methodological issues, but which are very important. Uh, yeah, it was because of the scarcity uh, or sources. Just an example, and then I uh, go uh, from these methodological uh, issues. Yeah, only an example. Of course, you heard about the famous uh, Sufi saint in Sin, uh, Lal Shabbat Kalanda. He's supposed to have died in 1274. So there is really a scarcity of course of sources about him before the British came. You can find some brief mention in 15th century sources, this and that, but very, almost nothing. And in comparison, I have a colleague uh, in my institution who is working on uh, Sufism in Egypt, and she did some research on uh, Sufi. He died in uh, almost the same year than Lal Shabazz, and there is so many sources from his death in the late 13th century and in the 14th, 15th, so it's very impressive. So it is a kind of constatation about the scarcity of written sources in Sindh and maybe in the Indus Valley. And already I want you to know that if you ask me why, I have no answer. <laughs> Because uh, when you are uh, in uh, academia also, you should be very aware of what you don't know. <laughs> and uh, of course, it's not possible to know all and everything. Firstly, because we are totally depending on the sources. Yeah, so um, to explore this uh, interaction between the symbolic construction of a community and the material uh, construction of the community through the structure, through the building, uh, the temple, the Sufi place, etc. Uh, I shall take uh, two case studies. So the first, uh, it is related to uh, Julelal, and the second, it is related to Sufi. And also what I shall do, that I shall adopt a kind of uh, balanced approach uh, between Sin and India, so between the, what is uh, occurring nowadays in Sin, in Pakistan, and also among uh, uh, the Sindhi in India. Oh. Yeah, so it is just a, a map of the present day uh, uh, seen uh, as an administrative unit, of course, but there is something interesting about Sindh. It is that uh, the border of this Sindh uh, changed throughout the century, because if you look at the medieval sources, because there are some <laughs> medieval sources, as you should know, Sindh was incorporating southern Punjab, what they called Siraiki Belt, and Multan was the capital of Sindh, uh, almost until the 13th, 14th century. And uh, so after there were some changes, and finally Sindh uh, was like it is here. But there is another thing to know. It is even in Pakistan, there are Sindhi uh, speaking population outside of Sindh, and es especially in the... Um, West, 
Ya, yeah, it is the west. Yeah. In the province of Baluchistan, there is a district, especially of Las Bella, uh, where they are speaking Sindhi. And also, you can find some other area uh, in other places, and even in India, in Rajasthan, uh, and in uh, Gujarat. Yeah, so uh, about uh, Jule Lal. Um, Yeah, about Julelal, so um, if you have a look, because also there is the tradition, there is the belief, but I am talking about historical sources. So in the historical sources, be the building like this one, like this temple, uh, be the literature, be the epigraphy, uh, inscription of different monument temples. Um, even so related to Julelal in Sin, uh, we don't have very old remains regarding this tradition. I'm not talking about the belief uh, about Julela appearing in the 10th century. I'm talking about the oldest remain we have regarding the tradition. So maybe this temple is one of the oldest of Julelal and it is in the city of uh, Nasserpur. It's not far from Hyderabad, Sindh. And uh, this structure, this build structure, is very representative of the oldest temple of Julelal in Sindh. Nowadays, it is uh, not anymore a temple. Uh, and in fact, this place is occupied by a family and, uh, but it is said that for uh, the main uh, celebration, the Hindu uh, can come and celebrate, the, especially for Chetit Chand, etc. But what is of interest is, is the structure, the built structure, because as you can see, there is a square. It is a square building with four kind of tower and with the dome. This is very important what in sin they call Gunbaz, especially, um, what is also a Persian word. And uh, so it should be one of the oldest temples. But unfortunately, I'm not archaeologist, and so I can really say how old it is. But according what we know from other monuments it seemed, it could be from a late 17th century on early 18th century. But in any case, for the followers of Julelal, it is the birthplace of Julelal, and uh, so it is where this temple was commemorating the birth of Julelal. And inside the temple still, there is a big piece of marble, and they used to say uh, it was the Gadi, the Tart, the throne of Julelal, where uh, he used to stay. Another uh, building, great building, devoted to Julelal in Sindh, and also it's not far from Hyderabad, and not very far from Nasserpur. So it is a very big built structure. Uh, what we can see already, it is that uh, the, the very symbol of this building is also this dome, but it's a little bit different if you compare with the previous one, especially the, it is a square always, but there are eight sides, and the dome is uh, upon this eight side. And in this, um, they call the dark bar of Udelolal in Sin, there are several domes like this one, uh, and it's really a big structure. Uh, here, Udelolal is the name of a village, but also in the oldest source devoted to Julelal. Uh, which was printed in late uh, 19th century. Uh, Julelal is mostly named Udelolal or Amarlal. Uh, Julelal is not much used in the first publication. And um, yeah, this place is very important and also it is said to be uh, the most important place devoted to Julelal. And it was confirmed yesterday uh, by a gentleman, but it is another story, okay? But uh, yeah, because uh, when Julelal disappeared, 
in a well on his horse, and we will show this well, we can see it now, this well here. So it is the most sacred place of the whole complex. Yeah, so it is said that Julelal disappeared on his horse in the well. And uh, uh, so it is why it is the most sacred place. And as you should know, uh, also uh, uh, Julelal uh, asked his cousin, but there is uh, more details, but I am giving the short story. He gave the, the, the lead of the pant uh, to his cousin, Pagar, and so after Pagar, his descendant, known as Takur, uh, they used to be the head of the pant of Julelal. And in the older sources, it was called Darya Pant, of course, the path of the river, of the Indus River. So uh, still, this Takur, they were uh, running this uh, big complex devoted to Julelal. And this complex also, uh, it should be According to the local people, they said that it was built uh, during Shah Jahan's rule, so late 17th century. Here, we don't have really source, I mean other source to confirm or not, but it is a local oral tradition. We know that Shah Jahan, during Shah Jahan rule, uh, Many buildings were completed. Shah Jahan, of the Mughal governor, uh, he was very active in building. Uh, for example, in Tata, there is a big mosque and very beautiful mosque, a Shah Jahan uh, mosque, very famous, with uh, decorative elements and so on. So, so it is possible that it was built during Shah Jahan's rule. But in any case, it would be 17th century. So not very old, I mean. Yeah, and in fact, the first iconographical representation of Julelal, uh, they are uh, on printed book, but there is another old temple, I shall turn back to it, uh, always in Sindh. Um, but, you know, these booklets were published in the 1920s, and so you can see uh, maybe the earlier representation of Julelal on the fish in the river. So uh, you can see w this one was published in Sakar because uh, Sakar was very active in publication in the 1920s in re regarding Julelal especially. Huh? Uh, almost half, half of the booklets devoted to Julelal, they were published in Sakar. And then after some in Hyderabad, Karachi, and also uh, Shikarpur. Yeah, so on the left side, supposedly, uh, Julelal is giving uh, the, how to say, is transmitting the tradition to his cousin, Pagar. But it is not confirmed neither. But it looks like he's transmitting the tradition. And so it was published in 1923, but it is the third edition, and I could not locate the first one. I don't know when the first edition was printed. On the other, it is published in the same, <clears throat> same year. Yeah, and also this uh, representation is very interesting. Uh, maybe first because two different scripts are used, the Arabic Sindhi, and Devanagri, and also it's very interesting, uh, I mean, in the context of constructing a community, because as you can see, Udel Olal is on the horse, and you can see who is before him, walking, and behind him. So the first is Pir Pato, is a very famous Sufi saint from Sindh, and the second is Lal Shabazz. And so uh, these Sufi, they are represented as being, how to say, inferior, sure, since they are working and he's on the horse. And they are like also uh, guard, also like kind of protector of Udalola. But uh, it's very interesting to see how this relationship uh, between uh, finally Udalola and this Sufi is represented of these uh, uh, pictures. Yeah, and here is, is also called Shri Amalal Udelolal Saheb. So Julelan 
No, you cannot find this name uh, in this uh, 1920s. Yeah, I turn back to this uh, Udel Olal because it's a very big complex, and so we had a program uh, still uh, with some uh, scholars from a uh, university in Karachi who are architects. So it's very interesting also when you are doing research project to work with a team and also with different specialists because you as historian, as anthropologist, you have your own perspective, but it's really very rich to cross your own approach with other specialists. And from even, we did a program in uh, Sevan Sharif also, and there was an architect and it was so amazing to see his own vision of the, uh, of the issue of Sevan, all this, very different, and I learned a lot. So similarly here, with this complex, and this plan was drawn by one of these uh, architects. Um, so, yeah, in fact, you have two structures, but uh, we, we can see the, um, the size, but if you want this side, it is about 70 meters. So it's a pretty big structure. But it is like a fort with tower at the each corner here. And this part, because you can see two main parts, this part, it is shared by Muslim and Hindu. So uh, I think that she has represented in green the Muslim and here in blue, uh, the Hindu, but so there is this uh, temple devoted to Julelal. There is here a kind of darga uh, devoted to one Sherta here, and it is said that it is the name that the Muslim give to Julelal. But and there is this space between both. Yeah. Also, there are other rooms. Uh, for example, you can find the sandals of uh, Julelal in one of them. There is here the tree that uh, he was able to make grow uh, through a miracle, etc. So, and facing this main structure, you have this other part, and this other part is totally Hindu. Uh, here, it is a well. You saw the picture. It is where, where is uh, located the well, uh, which is the uh, most sacred part of the structure. And every year, because also what is very interesting, it is this. There is a dual structure in this Darbar. And when I speak of structure, one of my main interests it was, it is what I call authority. Because when you have a tradition, who is transmitting the tradition? How do the people are learning a tradition? Who is telling this is right, this is not right? So every tradition, they have people, they can be priests or any other in all, the, all over the world you can find. And so also, this organization, which is still running, uh, it is said that it, it uh, goes back to Julelal, because Julelal has got both Hindu and Muslim followers, and so he wanted them to share this space devoted to him. So from the Muslim side, the head, you have, uh, they call a Sajjada Nashin. It is a common word for the Sufi Darga. So is Ghulam Abbas Sheikh, and on the Hindu side, uh, the head, she's a woman, and she's titled Gadi Nashin. But what is very interesting, it is that she's uh, Indian, and in fact, she lives in Mumbai. So twice a year, she visits this Udelolal for Cheti Chand, and she used to spend more than a month. And the other, it is for Asu, six months after Cheti Chan. And they are making the same celebration, exactly. So especially Barano, etc. And of course, uh, the World Festival ended when they threw the Barano inside the well where uh, Julela is said to have uh, disappeared. Um, so it's a very interesting uh, organization, but it is only in this place that such 
an organization, I mean, between Muslim and Hindu exist in Sim. Because there are many other temples devoted to Julelal, but they are only, so to say, Hindu, so they are not shared uh, with the Muslim. Yeah, she is, uh, yeah, here she is Matabina, so the Hindu Gadinashin. And she used to come with her sister and her sister daughter, and is the Gulama Bashir, the, yeah. And also, um, yes. Yeah, so it is another still, yeah. Yeah, and I'm very sorry and sad to answer I don't know. <laughs> no, because, it, so you have two ways. There are no written sources. Uh, we were able to collect some, but not before, uh, I think there, there is something in, from the 1930s. But it is not about Hindu Muslim. It was following a dispute between Muslim for adding this side. So uh, really, I don't know. But uh, because to some extent, there was a kind of competition for the control of the complex. So it is possible, but at some point, the Muslim were dominating. And so the Hindu, they wanted to have their own complex, even if they still kept a small temple in the Muslim part. But you know, for example, for Cheti Chen, it is very interesting. So, of course, there are only Hindu who come. So, the main celebration, it is in the Hindu part. And the Muslim part, they put the bazaar, the, you know, all the people who are selling all and everything. Uh, so, it is in the Muslim part. So, but, uh, yeah, of course, it, it is a very important question, but I don't know. But, you know, also, I think this is running since century since centuries, so we can imagine uh, how many negotiations between different people, different clans, different this, different that. Sometimes a very good source for other places are the, the British archives, because after the British came to Sindh after 1843, very often where there was a um, issue between people for the control of a religious place, they went to the British uh, court. And so you have many, many. But on Udalolal, I never found uh, anything. So I don't know. <laughs> so. Yeah, this is uh, also maybe one of the oldest temples. And once again, you can see it is the same structure. I mean, basic structure. But um, in fact, the photos of uh, 1989 was shot by a French archaeologist. So 1990, 30 years back, I think. Yeah, and w when she went, and never I saw any mention of this temple. It is in Gorabari. It is very south of uh, Saint. It is in the delta part, it's very close to the, to the sea, this village. Never I saw any mention, okay? So this uh, French archaeologist, she was uh, exploring some archaeological sites and she saw this temple. Uh, I think when she went in 1989, there were three temples and I went in 2016, only one was uh, staying. Um, but also I went back in 2018, I didn't show pictures, but still the uh, local Hindu, they were renovating the temple and they were doing performing uh, RT and they had put a picture of Julelal uh, in this temple. But uh, what is very a pity when I say that two temples have disappeared, it is that in one of them there were painting, wall painting, uh, very beautiful. And unfortunately, my friend, the archeologist, she didn't take good picture of this painting. Only 
It is what she shot on this wall painting, but it is really precious because once again, I suppose it is the oldest pictural representation related to Julelal. And unfortunately, we can see here a snake. So uh, when you ask people, they say it is named Ketpal, he was a bodyguard of Julelal. You can see this kind of uh, palanquin, you can see on a horse, you can see here also, uh, you can see this kind of guard, and uh, this guard, they are similar when we saw uh, Udel Olal with Pilpato, and uh, they are the same uh, drawing, so it's very interesting also. So it's really a pity that this uh, uh, freezes, that this uh, wall painting have, have disappeared. There is another part also when we saw uh, a figure sat on a throne, so probably Julela, but it's, very, it's not very good uh, neither. So according to my friend, also this temple should have been built in the uh, 17th century, so similarly that the two previous one from uh, Nasserpur and Udelola. Yeah, so constructing and reconstructing, because uh, during my uh, late visit to Northern Sin, and it was one month back in October, I was very amazed because I had planned to visit this temple in Sakar. It is on the bank of the Indus River, and it is named Jindapir, another name for Julelal. And I was very amazed because uh, the local community, they had demolished the previous one, and they are building a big one. But what is very interesting is that uh, they are also keeping, so to say, the dome, a big dome as a symbol. You know, this one, it was already there from the old structure, but it was the only dome in the world structure. It was a pretty big structure already, especially with room for the pilgrim, this and that, and when there is Chetty Chan. But now they are building this big. And it's very interesting because this, so it's very close to the Indus River, you can see it from very far. And even from the opposite bank of the river, you know there is Rory, the city of Rory. You can see the, the dome, so it's very uh, interesting. Yeah, now, um, so we are uh, traveling from Sin to India. Okay, so I don't, uh, I will not be very long about how uh, Julelal became the Sindhi god, uh, uh, etc. More or less, but it is what uh, uh, many people said. And for example, I remember once in Mumbai, I was looking for a Julelal temple, so I was asking people from the neighborhood, they were not Sindhi, so I was asking Julelal temple, no, and after I asked Sindhi temple, and so they knew <laughs> Where was the Sindhi temple? Okay. Yeah, so it's also uh, very interesting to see uh, how the Sindhi community in India um, are building new temples devoted to Julelal. But of course, the build structure and the architectural tradition is different. And the main difference is that the dome has been uh, forgotten, of course, in the new environment of India. So there is this uh, project, the Julelal Tirat Dam project, uh, headed and thought by Professor Subhadra Anand, uh, following uh, the, her PhD. She did, I don't remember what, in the 1990s, maybe. Uh, it is uh, National Integration of Sindhi. It's a very good study of uh, how the Sindhi migrated to India, how they uh, resettled, uh, the issue with the ident specific identity as Cindy, etc. And finally, she went to the conclusion that one uh, way, not the only one, but one way for the preservation of the Cindy identity in India was to build a pilgrimage site. 
not only uh, temple only, I mean, a pilgrimage, because uh, she was uh, saying, and it is in the conclusion uh, of her book, uh, that, for example, the Christians, they have Roma, the Muslim Mecca, uh, the Hindu, Varanasi, this and that. And so she conclude, but it was a kind of hypothesis also, uh, that if there was a big pilgrimage center, uh, specifically Cindy, so with Julela, like the man uh, deity, it could help to preserve the Cindy identity. And so this project was started now some years back, uh, and uh, still they have completed the first phase no, sorry, I forget to talk about the location. Yeah, because also it's very interesting uh, when uh, Subhadra is discussing about what would be the best location for this Tirat Dam. And so, of course, uh, should we go where the, the majority of the Sindhi, I don't know, uh, or another place? And so, finally, they decided uh, to build it in Katch and very close to the border with Sindh. And uh, of course, because you know when they started the project, uh, the uh, chief minister was Narendra Modi in Gujarat. So they had to ask, uh, because it was a government uh, land for uh, buying it. And so I'm quoting Subhadra. So uh, Modi told her, you should build a very big uh, statue of Julelal. Uh, it would be a symbol of all the effort the Sindhi uh, have done in India and uh, how uh, active they are and they were, etc. And this big statue can be seen from very far also. And so in the idea of Subhadra and the other, they wanted the statue of Julelal to be seen from Sindh also. <laughs> I suppose, I suppose. But still, it is not. But I think the plan to build a 20 meters statute and Julelal looking at Sindh, oriented near the west to Sindh. So it is a very ambitious project, but still, the first phase has been completed. And so there is uh, what they call the small temple. And uh, they have started uh, celebrating Cheti Chand in this uh, small temple. Yeah, and also I uh, did an interview with the architect uh, who is in charge of the project. So the architect is uh, Nishan Lal, is from Delhi. And I was very interested how he went to imagine what was the Julela temple. He's not Cindy. Uh, I, I asked him, how did you document, how, or what, what did Subhadra and the committee told you? Do they, did they tell you to do this and that? And uh, uh, how did you find the uh, representation? How did you imagine? And so first he told me that he was... Uh, uh, mostly free to organize himself, but already he has built uh, many uh, temples in India. And finally, so he focused of this uh, temple in uh, South India, Einhall. Personally, I don't know. Before this, I didn't know. But also, his argument was that uh, it, this place and especially the Durga temple, so belongs, and I quote him, uh, to the cradle of ancient Hindu temple architecture. So for him, he wanted, but I suppose, uh, like the committee of the Jolala Tirat Dam, this temple to be in the continuity of the ancient Hindu temple architecture. And finally, the, you can see uh, especially with the uh, map of the plan, that it is uh, similar to some extent, especially so you are going, the statute of the deity is at the end of the building and you have to walk through different uh, steps, so to say, uh, to reach uh, the statute. 
and of course also this temple as a kind of tower, but closest to what is called usually Shikara, for the, the usual name for the tower of the Hindu temple, but from, more from the north tradition than from the south tradition. Yeah, so the, this is this uh, a temple which has been completed, and also the statues of Julelal was uh, installed. Yeah, so just it is the kind of transition between us, because now it's a few words, very brief, about the Sufi tradition. But this poster was so for, in this Udel uh, al-Darba, and it's very uh, interesting to see that other people, they put Shabdul Latif and uh, Julelal, and also uh, the main inscription above, it is written, Sabka Malik Ek He. And this formula now in Sindh, it is more and more popular. I know, not even in Sindh, but now in many uh, Hindu temples in Sindh, you can see uh, this. It's, it's pretty recent. Some years back, I, I never saw this inscription. So it's interesting to see how the people from uh, Udalal, they wanted to put a kind of link between Shah uh, Abdul Latif uh, and Udalal. Yes, so uh, briefly, a few words on the uh, uh, Sufi tradition and especially how it was uh, transmitted in India. Because, of course, everybody knows Ram Panjvani and especially for the role he played in promoting Julelal as the Sindhi god, as the Sindhi uh, community god. But something which is less known, it is that also he... Less known, no, I suppress but he was very fond of Sufi poetry. And you know, before focusing on Julelal, uh, Ram Panjvani, he did publish Sufi poetry and even before partition, because he was born in 1911 and still in Sindh, uh, in Karachi, was very active. Uh, he was already teaching Sindhi literature, but also he was giving many conferences uh, on the Sufi poetry, this and that. And so even in India, in the, there is no date, but I think the first edition, it was in the 1950s, so soon after he migrated to India, the, almost the first book he did publish were related to Sufi poetry in Sindhi, the kind of compilations of the main Sufi authors, and not only Shah Abdul Latif, many, many other Sufi uh, poets. So, um, yeah, so after partition, but even before, there were a kind of a Sufi tradition among the Hindu of Sindh. And when uh, I speak of Sufi tradition, so it doesn't mean that they used to sing Shah Jori Salo or any Sufi poetry. It means that they have been initiated by a Sufi master and they had become themselves Sufi. But for being Sufi, there is no need specifically to be Muslim. It is not related to your, I would say, daily practice of your uh, ancestral religion. So Sevan is a very important Sufi uh, town in Sindh. And Especially, there was a very important Sufi, uh, Mulchan Fakir. He has been initiated by this Jana uh, Basrat Said Raki Al Shah Sufi Al Qadiri, and he's also a very important poet. He published a lot of Sufi poetry in Sindhi. So, this uh, Mulchan, he himself was a Sufi. He was doing rituals in the Daba or Maza of Lal Shabbas Kalanda, and he was doing a lot of meditation himself, and himself he had initiated a Sufi among his uh, Hindu followers. But he refused to migrate. He wanted to stay in Sewan, uh, close to Lal Shabbas Kalanda, so he died in 1962. But so in Sewan, he, he has some uh, place. Kolastan or Magbaro. 
Yeah, I'm sorry, I have to be very, yeah. So this uh, Gaimal Modvani, he was his main follower, so himself a Hindu Sufi, and he migrated. So Mulchan stayed in Sevan, men, but all his followers, Hindu followers, they migrated to India. And in India, they recreate, reconstruct this tradition uh, of the Sufi Mulchan Fakir. So first they settled in Ulas Nagar, but after, because they were working in Ulas Nagar, of course, but after, you know, they, they were dispatched in different parts of India, and finally uh, they decided to build a new place in Haridva. And so today, this Sufi tradition is still uh, continued uh, in Haridva, so in northern India. And also, this Hindu follower himself, they initiated new followers, and also they used to publish uh, literature, Sufi literature, and uh, always in Sindhi. In the beginning, it was published in Arabic, Sindhi, but now they are still uh, publishing in Devanagari, uh, Sindhi. So uh, this is what I wanted to uh, talk about tonight, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Professor, just a question. Um, since the um, literary sources were unavailable, there are very few to rely on. What about the oral tradition, uh, which I'm sure would have passed down by word of mouth? And uh, did you uh, explore that as an anthropologist yeah, and a historian? Yeah, of course, there is oral tradition, of course. But um, so I would say that it implies uh, very to spend much time, a lot of time, because, for example, we, we had a program in Sevan for four years, and every year we were staying one month there. We were five French, and with other people, maybe seven. So, uh, you know, you collect the story one version of the story, two, three, four, five, six, seven, hundred. So you see how to manage, how to deal. It, il, it is a work in itself, I mean. And uh, so, of course, we have collected, but already, in relation with uh, this Lal Shabbat, there are so many difference between the version from this category of people, this one, this and that. It's very difficult to deal with. And uh, otherwise, I, as I said, uh, you will have to spend a lot of time and to uh, also ask many people to work on it. So it is, we didn't neglect it because we used to collect some, but for sure, it was not enough. Uh, I have two questions. Hello? Yeah. I have two questions. Uh, one is, what is the reason behind um, uh, the use of the color white and gold uh, on temples and statues? Is there any symbolic meaning behind those colors. And the second question is, um, what, uh, who is funding this temple in Kutch? How did they collect the money? Who is funding In Kutch? Yeah. OK. Uh, so I start with the second, <laughs> donors. 
especially, yeah, I will not quote names, but one of them is very famous in India. No, you can find it on, uh, on internet because they have a website, so of course you can uh, find it easily. And about the colors, it's a very important question and not so easy to understand because once again, there are different versions about the symbolic meaning of the color. So usually the white is associated with uh, purity and uh, gold, it is uh, more complicated. There are different meanings. But very often, you know, the issue of power, be it religious or political, they are using the same symbols. And for example, the gold was a symbol of power for the kings, this and that. So gold is a symbol of power, of majesty, and all this. The white color doesn't have anything to do with, uh, you know, like the setting. If it's like a desert, then having white being... Uh, with? I didn't... With the desert? Like, you know, it's a hot setting, so the color white wouldn't absorb... I never heard. Heat, no. It doesn't mean that it, it has nothing to do. Uh, this is not very profound, but <clears throat> you were talking about these uh, gumbuses uh, falling down or collapsing for whatever reason. No. No, I, the ones that you said had disappeared. Ah, excuse me, yeah. in Godavari, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Mohenjo-daro has essentially disappeared because of natural causes. Uh, does the proximity to the sea or the fact that it's in the delta have mm. a lot to do with... Yeah. The, the, yeah. Or is it anything Yeah, else? There, are, there are two main answers and a third related to the second. Yeah, the first, it is very close near the ocean in the delta, and uh, uh, it's a very special area. And yeah, so uh, really the sea is very uh, uh, corrupting about the building. But also, it is because the local Hindu has left. It, it is what the local population told us, and so nobody was maintaining this, before this renewal uh, I was talking about. And so I think that the, especially the dome started to collapse and after it has collapsed, the local people, they used to take stones for their own building, but this happens everywhere, you know. But Mohammed is protected by the government. Exactly. I totally uh, agree with you that uh, the Sin government have a lot to do because there are so many architectural remains. But, uh, but also, I mean, uh, Manjodaro is uh, different because it is also uh, protected by uh, UNESCO, you know how you say in English, uh, United Nations uh, things and uh, yeah. Uh, the, oh, the gentleman. Sorry. Okay. Um, I have two questions, Professor. One is, uh, you know, you mentioned in the architecture, etc., the Persian influences. So prior to the, you know, Sindh community being there, like, what, was it more because of the rulers there, or was there some origins of the Sindh, Sindhi community from Persia? You're t that you're is one question. But what are you talking about? I'm sorry. Julelal uh, Tiradda? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, and Uderolal. And the second question is what you mentioned in the Uderolal, you know, the synergy between the Hindu and Muslim. It's a very relevant example for our times here. So I'm very curious to know, like, are there, like, young people from Karachi or from India as well, like, kind of taking on that tradition of poetry or literature? Is it being seen in more contemporary writings? Or, you know, is there anything like that that you've come across? Uh, but for the first question... I, the first question, I'm just curious about, and forgive my lack of knowledge here, <laughs> but I don't know if I... I was just curious, like, whether part of this community migrated from elsewhere and therefore carried with it uh, the Persian influences like the Parsi community, or was it an influence of the Persian rulers in that region, you know, that architecture and then all of that? No, but you are not talking about the Julelal Tiradam. Huh. I'm no. talking about the Sindhi community. 
And but in sin or in, in because sin, Julela in Tiradam, there no, is no, no, nothing no, from... Not the Julela uh, Tiradam, the Udero oh. Lal. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. Persian, yeah, yes, so... Probably, but more because this building is sub supposed to have been built during Mughal. So it okay. was more a Mughal influence okay. in terms of architecture. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, and probably because it was a, a specific Mughal, um, how you say, uh, he was ruling the province in the name of Shah Jahan who was especially active. So I suppose that he took the Mughal patterns because the Mughal was very great builders, as you know, in Fatehpur Sikri, in so many uh, places. So yeah, it was a Mughal uh, typical uh, influence. Sir, uh, can you tell me exactly date and year of our century for uh, Dev Julelal? Birth time, exactly date, year approximately which century or which year One no, thing. i i can tell you what the tradition says in common era it says that Jolelal was born in 950 no 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 excuse me <laughs> i'm confusing no 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 10th century According to the tradition, Julelal uh, was on earth in the 10th century. So, as I heard, or seen, many friends have seen two places. One is in Nasarpur, birthplace, from uh, Odirolal has come on a house <laughs> afterwards. Second place in Sakhar, from here he has gone on uh, this palo, fish. Mm. So, both places are not in good condition. So government or uh, international fraternity is the day of Sindhis, just like uh, Guru Nanak, uh, Guru Nanak Dev, uh, this uh, Kartarpur, uh, Kartarpur or Nankana Sahib, they have given full heri international heritage status. So suppose we will not get international heritage status. Here we are telling it is Isti Dev, Isti Dev. After 10, 15 years, both places will be disappear or yeah. just like you'll be. Yes. So what is system or something? But uh, you know, frankly, since the years I'm going to Sindh, uh, I feel there is a change, and I have two examples. There, there is a Julila temple in Karachi near Custom House. When I started to come, it was closed. It was closed, it was abandoned. They, have, they had put a, a shop, this, and some five years back, the Karachi municipality with the architect, they decided to reopen the temple and it was totally renovated by the Karachi municipality. So now it is uh, working, uh, people are coming. And another one, uh, it is uh, Varundev Mandir, it is in Manora. In Karachi, you know Manora? Yes, the, of course, you know the island. Also, this one, when I started to come, it was closed. It was uh, abandoned. And a private uh, Karachi foundation also decided to start the renovation. And it has been renovated. And now it is open. And now it is working. So, but also, frankly speaking, in Sin, there are many, many architectural remains. For example, you have the Buddhist Tupa, and especially the big one near Mirpur Kras is very big and it's, it's totally, uh, so there are many, and yes, especially it should be uh, international aid, but uh, also a uh, last thing, this uh, I was forgetting to tell, you know this Manora, Temple, yes. Varun Dev, uh, yes. he was funded by the American Embassy of Pakistan, the renovation. Yes. Thank you. Uh, like, uh, descending from the Takur family, the Julelal uh, family, slowly I have seen 80% of the Sindhis of Takur has become Patan and it's ascending to Muslims. So 80% of Sindhis have been forcefully or they have converted to Sindh. Do you have some glimpse of this? Do you have any awareness? Uh, are you... Uh, the Muslims, the Sindhi Muslims, 
80% from the Takur has become Pathan, and from Pathan, they have become uh, Muslims and these. Um, but what do you call Takur? Because there are different meanings. Takur is uh, also from the path of uh, Julelal ascending. From uh, the Julelal family. Okay. Is in the Takur, like the Pandit. Not, call not Rajput Takur. No, no, no. no okay. Not Rajput Takur. Um, so I didn't hear anything about in recent years especially. But I mean because all these Takur, because they are the name of the priest of Julelal, uh, they have all migrated to India. Nine sin, you can find any. And so it was not easy for me to find uh, the Takur family in India. So until now, I met only two Takur family. One here in Bangalore, the other in Ullasnaga, and so they never told me about this issue, I'm sorry. What? Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, I don't. Okay. I know, I don't know. I, I should go next time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for the lovely, insightful talk on, on, on our community this evening. We really enjoyed the talk. The one question that I have is, is it right to say that Sindh is the birthplace of Sufism? Or did Sufism come into Sindh or, was it, or did it grow out of Sindh? No, sin is not the birthplace of Sufism. Sufism was born uh, in the Near East, in countries like Syria and Iraq especially. It is where it started to develop. And from, because also in this time it was the main uh, cities of the Muslim, especially Damascus, and after Baghdad, they were capital. And so it is especially in this area that the first Sufi appear. First they were renunciant, and after they formed this uh, Sufi order, yeah. And from there, they migrated to different parts of the world, to the west and to the east, yeah. But in uh, Saint South Asia, and especially um, in this valley, mainly the Sufis, they started to come in the 13th century, but first from Iraq, Iran, and you know why? Because there was a Mughal, Mongol, not Mughal, Mongol invasion. It is when Chinggis Khan came from the north and they destroyed all in Iran, they went to Baghdad, they, they took Baghdad in 2058, something like this. And so many populations there, they run, and especially the Sufi, and that's how uh, they came to South Asia, to India. Before there were but a few. The main uh, Sufi population went to Indus Valley in Multan, especially. One of the most important was Baudin Zakaria in Multan and also after in Sindh, we quote Pir Pato and Lal Shabazz Kalanda also. I can't. Ah, yes. Yes, so it is a tradition of uh, Multan Fakir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and it was very interesting because the gentleman who is heading now this uh, uh, Sufi uh, tradition, his name is uh, Bassan Jetvani, and he told me, uh, because I asked him, what did you uh, select Haridvar? Of course, Haridvar is a <laughs> well-known uh, religious place, but I mean in, re in relation with Sufi. And so he told me, his answer was, because we cannot go to the Indus River, so we go to the Ganga. It was his response. So still they're organizing uh, every year the fair, annual fair of this tradition and so on. Yeah. Uh, Good at evening, the beginning Professor. of the uh, presentation, there was a talk about an exhibition 
coming up shortly. I think whether you mentioned it, Sam, or? Yeah, maybe, and you said he would throw some more light on that? Or? No? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, Professor. Up in end of December, uh, 2020, in Bombay at the Chhatrapati Shivaji Museum, and I'll let you know as we get closer. So, if you could leave your name and email ID, I'd be happy to add you to the list. Good evening, Professor. Thank you Good for evening. this knowledgeable course. What you are giving to everybody, to all the Sindhis. My question is very simple but slightly complicated. In most of your talks, you are saying that uh, Hindus visited the the temples. Why not? It could be also the Sindhis visited the Sindhi temple and why Sindhis are not considered to be as Sindhi Sindhis, like Marathi as Marathis, Gujarati as Gujaratis and Sindhi as Sindhis. You are taking it everywhere as Sindhi Hindus. So as history somewhere saying that Sindhis were Hindus or Sindhis were not Hindus. I'm sorry, I don't understand. I no, mine, uh, my question is that Every religion, like Marathis are Marathis, Gujaratis are Gujaratis. Like we Sindhu, Sindhis are called as Hindus. Why not Sindhi Sindhis? Does history play any part or role in that? Yes. <laughs> no, so it, it is, uh, so it is what you ask, why I am referring to Hindu Sindhi and non-Hindu Sindhi. If you prefer, I can refer to Muslim Sindhi and non-Muslim Sindhi. <laughs> no, because uh, even we don't have to exaggerate it, the importance of religion, this, this is a difference. I'm sorry, but I feel that you are not happy with my answer. <laughs> no, but if you can uh, develop. No. Uh, professor, when partition happens, all Sindhis have come. So that generation uh, left history also there. So many people, even uh, I say current generation or young generation means 40, up to 40 years now also, they don't know more history about sin. The roots are there, but we have started everything here. Suppose you know uh, Julelal Bhagans Jyot, we have taken from there directly and put in uh, Ulasnagar, in Bangalore also, in many places. So we have created everything here and we cannot go there frequently or easily. So our community is grateful and very thankful to you. Even from India, we have not done so much uh, research or something. And from France, you are doing so much uh, research and uh, doing so much great job. And coming here and uh, telling, uh, uh, and uh, we inspire from you. And we feel that because of internet, Sindhi language and Sindhi culture has been uh, saved. If internet was not there 20 years before, we have gone away from everything. From you, we want many young generations, people through internet, through theoretical, practical. Again, we have to go to see roots, and uh, this is big asset. And uh, I always say that uh, we have given uh, key of locker to our children, but they do not know what uh, so much big asset is there. They even don't know, open the locker and see the asset. And you have come, you have taken that asset and now you're telling us everything we know. We are, our Sindhi community is th thankful to you always, sir. Th thank you. <laughs> and uh, our group, uh, Mr. Bharat Amanani, uh, our uh, other group, we want to honor you also at this stage after you are, this talk is over, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mine is a small observation that I wanted to share with you. Uh, Shia Muslims who originated from Persia, they say that they address Julelal as Ali. They also pray to Julelal. And he, they worship him, they said. One of my Shia Muslim friends said that. Yes, but I think he's talking about Lal Shabazz Kalanda. Huh. Because the same thing, but a different name, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, because now even this uh, name Jolelal is applied to Lal Shabbos calendar. Yeah. Yes, and it is another issue, <laughs> but uh, difficult to answer. But you're right, yeah. And one question. Uh, you being French, born in France, how did Cindy attract you? <laughs> Uh, so I put it short. <laughs> no, uh, very young I was interested by history and I was interested by non-Western civilization. So uh, uh, first I started with Egypt, the pyramid, this and that. And so when I started to study at the university, I traveled over the world and I was interested by different places and very soon I was doing history. First I uh, focused on some community, especially the Aga Khan's follower. So I did my PhD on this and that's how I uh, came to India because first I started in Mumbai because uh, there was a very important uh, Ismaili Aga Khani community still they are in uh, Kolaba, Karimabad. And uh, also they told me that after partition, many migrated to Karachi and Sin. So it's how I went to Karachi for this work on the Ismaili. And then I learned that they were Ismaili Sindhi. So in Southern Sin, uh, near uh, Tata or Badin, this part, there are many uh, Sindhi Ismaili villages. And that's how I went to discover the Sindhi culture and Sufism, etc. Uh, professor? Yeah. Yeah, I just have a question which is slightly removed from your discussion. I was just wondering about the Sadhu Aswani mission. Where do you locate that in the context of this whole thing of Sindhi religiosity? Yes, um, yeah, there are different uh, Sindhi spiritual movements, at you, as you know, but of course, this uh, Sado is one of the most famous. You, I, I never really focus on him, even if I visited uh, Pune, the, the main places. But was, what was of interest when me, what I did study in uh, Sado Vasvani, it is his approach to Sufism because he has published books on Sufism, and so it was very interesting to see how he used Sufism, and when I say Sufism, it is especially Sufi poetry in Sindhi, how this has nurtured his own reflection and the building of his own spirituality. But, uh, and also uh, Sadhu Vasvani, like many other Sindhi, spiritual people and intellectuals, including Rampanjvani, they were very much influenced by a spiritual movement named Theosophical Society. I'm sure you have heard about. Because this Theosophical Society, uh, it was founded in New York by some uh, American, but they wanted to build a kind of universal religion, mostly inspired by Indian religion. And in fact, the founder of the Theosophical Society, they went to India, and even one, Annie Besant, she became president of the Congress of the National. So she was also involved in two nationalists. It is another story. But in Sindh, Annie Besant, she went to Karachi and Hyderabad in, in late 19th century. And uh, she, through her speeches, be, but because also she translated Hindu religious scripture into English, this and that. So the, the Sindhi intellectuals, they were very attracted. And one of them, because these Theosophists, they were looking for the uh, universal wisdom. And according to them, 
the founder, Elena Blavatsky, she thought that there was a kind of place in the Himalaya mountain where wise men used to gather and they were still holding the primitive universal wisdom. So the Sindhis uh, transformed this uh, discourse of the Theosophical Society and they went to claim both Muslim and Hindu, I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but they said that, in fact, this wisdom the Theosophists were talking about was uh, Sindhi Sufism. You can find it in the writing of Shah Juri Salo. So, uh, yes, I know why I'm talking about. So, uh, even Rampanjvani himself, he was a member, and I found archives in Karachi, uh, of this Theosophical Society in the 19th 30s, and Sadhu Vasvani, in his memoir, he put that also he used to attend uh, the lecture in the Theosophical Society about this conception of uh, universal brotherhood, uh, this and that. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, my question is about uh, the community being very successful in certain professions, industry, and so on. They're very vibrant. So uh, has your study come across that? Have you... Uh, research that and the reasons why you know this community is in specific uh, yeah so you, you are talking about the economic side yeah, of the, yeah. Side, yeah it is not uh, my field yeah. but there there are studies about there are several books about there is one by uh, mark anthony falzon it is named cosmopolitan network, but it is about the Cindy uh, all over the world, how they went to build these uh, international networks. And also there is one by Claude Markovitz. It is more in colonial, how the Sindh work is. So uh, mostly he's studying the Shikarpuri and the Hyderabadi, how they went to build this network, uh, some from Shikarpur to Central Asia, Hyderabadi, and also because the Sindhi communities, not only most of the trader communities of uh, India, they developed that network throughout the British Empire. So since the British, uh, you can find them, they were dominating the world, so the, the Sindhi trader, but also the Gujarati and many other, uh, they used to follow the, the road of the British Empire and the used to settle uh, all over the world. But so, if you want, there is the book by Claude Markovitz, especially, on this colonial phase, and Mark Anthony Felson after uh, colonization. Uh, my question is uh, more on, you know, when you talk about the creation of the Julelal Tirtha, the new setup of the temple, and... Uh, Julelal Tirtha. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So they're setting up a new, um, you know, sacred space and everything. Uh, basically, the Sindhi community is a very flourishing community, and uh, they are successful all over. Why do you think that uh, they are not doing the same effort within the initial structure, the real structure, and uh, moving away from that? Why do you think, is it something governmental where the country is not allowing them to, you know, like Kartarpur, yeah. the Sikhs, wanted it, and it happened finally. I mean, it's taken years, but it has happened. Do you think the Sindhi community at some point wanted that to happen there in the original area of Nasirpur, where the real Julelal, you know, like you say, the well is there and the yeah. whole setup so, is Yeah, uh, so now I shall not dare to say the Hindu oh. uh, Sindhi. <laughs> but no, no, you know why? Especially if you compare with the, with the six, because among the Sindhi, there were no centralization process which occurred among the six with, for different reasons, but especially uh, uh, through the confrontation with the Mughal, this and that. So in, in, in Sindh, this community always uh, were always fragmented community. And uh, even, for example, the Daba Odel Olal, even now this uh, Taco gentleman, he said it is the most important place. So the lineage of the Gadinashin should be supposed to be the head of the tradition. 
but not. And even in Sin, I have visited maybe in Sin 20 Julela temple. They are all independent. They are transmitting a similar tradition, we can say. But of course, they know each other. This, but they, in terms of authority, they are all independent. So this is a very important point, but also difficult to document. But uh, I suppose that it is also uh, related to the social, social structure of the community, of the location, because all these communities, they are very localized and very attached to their own locality. Yeah. Uh, but no centralization process. It is the main answer. And just going from there, that do you see any kind of, uh, you know, the government, like you said, that the Karachi government uh, or the municipality yeah. redid the you yeah. know, Karadar uh, yeah. thing, um, temple. Similarly, do you think that they would, do you see that they would be working on other temples and maybe why not uh, get a UNESCO heritage site tag or something yeah. like that? Yeah. Uh, yes, the, but uh, uh, also this is the matter of uh, how to select the monument you will propose to UNESCO. Because I, I am sorry, but in terms of size, there are many bigger monuments in Sin. Because, uh, uh, so it doesn't mean that, of course, they are not uh, important and of interest, but there are uh, many monuments uh, which would need to be repaired and, uh, and you know, even the, the Sindhi, even the inhabitants of Karachi, as you know, they are mostly Mohadjir, they are always complaining that the government uh, is not uh, doing his work for this preservation, and there are a number of private associations, usually run by architects, who are trying to do it, but of course they need a lot of funding, so. Yeah, 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 but so you, knowing the size of Mohenjo-Daro, you can imagine the funding it would need. It's only an issue because they are, yeah, you're totally right, sir. So it would need to be, yes? Uh, firstly, I appreciate all the knowledge yeah, that... Yeah, last, excuse me. Sorry, I'll repeat myself. Firstly, I appreciate all the knowledge that you have shared with us. Like someone rightly pointed out that a lot of the younger generation among the Sindhi community is not fully aware of our roots back there. Is there some literature or some books that you would suggest that we could read up on to, to catch up on all of that? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I think that uh, we can uh, provide some reference, uh, especially through the Sindhi Culture Foundation. Yes, that would be helpful. Thank you. No, so I, I mean to, to draw a kind of list of basic reference. Yes. So we can, we can uh, work. Because on my own, I've been trying to look up books and read some, but I think if it comes from an expert, it'll be much more fruitful. Yeah, but so I can forward, uh, yes. Thank you. If I may, sorry, but I know it's getting very late, but last comment, Professor, uh, I mean, with the help of the organizers, if everyone interested could give their names, and if there was some possibility right here to begin a cultural exchange of sorts with people starting at the University yeah. of Karachi, then maybe we can flag it off and see what comes out of it. Yeah, because yeah, I'm yeah. particularly so interested because it's so symbolic, an example of the synergy. It would be relevant for the whole of India like I'm non Sindhi, but I'm very interested in this because, you know, I'm okay. I'm Indian. So, okay, so thank you. Okay. Thank you.